big open when you're ready to lo uh, go, let me know. So when for some reason, uh, your photo looks uh, contrast very well, but mine is kind of a weird. You're, you're talking about the way it looks on the, on the screen? Yeah, it's, it's on yeah, the you know, I think it, I think the camera in the room is um, maybe saturating a little bit. It, it does look weird, yeah. But yours looks great. Hmm. Yeah, yours both uh, from my screen, uh, both of them looks wonderful. But uh, for some reason, when the display, my one looks like a, a very bright. Yeah, so maybe it's auto uh, sensitivity setting on the camera or something. Yeah, but anyway, since I don't give a presentation, so it's fine. <laughs> I don't hear the audio from the room anymore. I don't know if you do. Uh, no. They probably keep. Oh, they're, they're muted. Yeah, Kai. I guess Kai muted. Anyway. So when, uh, so when you you know uh, Dan uh, when he was a student here. Right? Oh yeah, yeah, I was an undergraduate. Yeah, undergrad. Yeah. Yeah, he's um, he said we we met around nineteen seventy seven, which is a very incredibly long time ago. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I I met Dan uh, in '87. Uh, yeah, ten years later. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What were you doing in 1977? Zhang, mm -hmm. so, what what were you doing in 1977? <laughs> 1977, I was in the countryside. <laughs> okay. I was a builder dam. Oh. Okay. Uh, well, uh, yeah, for a reservoir in Beijing. I was in the countryside, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. 1977, that's a year I, uh, in principle, actually into a university. Hmm. Yeah. Kai, it looks like the microphone, Kai Davis is, is muted there. I don't hear anything. They, uh, they mute for us now, yeah. Yeah, I wonder if they're still just setting up there. Probably our conversation, you can hear it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> If nobody orders, like yeah, they have. so when uh, you were uh, 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 introduction to Dan, yeah, I also sure. follow a very short one as well. Sure. Yeah. 
Okay, Wayne, if you want to go ahead and introduce Dan, now is sure. the time. Yeah, happy to. Um, so hi, everybody. It's, um, it's a beautiful day, and we're happy to have uh, Dan Blumenthal in Rochester. And um, he is Distinguished Professor in ECE, UCSB, uh, Director of Terabit Optical Ethernet Center. Um, and he heads the uh, Optical Communication and Photonics Integration Group. Um, he's co-founder of Packet Photonics and Calient Networks, has many US patents and published many, many papers in, in quite a wide range. Um, Dan, um, I think of Dan as a undergraduate run and working in a, in a research group with Gerard Morel, who was my advisor. And, um, and of all the 525 papers that Dan has published, I probably think about, Dan, maybe it was the first one you ever published as an undergraduate um, on, on picosecond um, X-band microarray of work. And uh, so I was asking Si Chung, uh, so you know, Dan, I met Dan in 1977. And as you all know, Si Chung has, has taken over uh, not from picosecond microwaves all the way to now femtosecond terahertz stuff. It's a big career now. What was he doing in 1977 when I met Dan? And Si Chung, you can tell him what you were doing in 1977 when I met Dan. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, I think the first time which I met Dan was in uh, Columbia University uh, in uh, 87, when I worked at uh, Dave, Dave Austin's group, and Dan uh, worked in uh, a Paul's group, Paul Personnel's group here now. So uh, actually, our office are very close to each other, just across a, a small hallway. And basically, three seconds, I can uh, reach to uh, his desk. So from time to time, we often share our interest in research, as well as a number of other things for family life, for a vision in the future, and working with Stephen Boss. And also we have a good fun here now. Also with a rich Oscars group, with a number of other a very big top player at Columbia University. So we have a wonderful time at Columbia University. Dan is a very distinguished researcher. And he has been moved a few places, like uh, uh, he went to Georgia, and then finally to Santa Barbara, and has done so wonderful in uh, Santa Barbara, made uh, many uh, distingu distinguished career uh, award as well as uh, research achievement. So I'm uh, very impressed to uh, watch uh, Dan's uh, great uh, improvement and also a great achievement here now. So uh, his talk actually is, uh, very, as uh, Wayne said, is very broad. And uh, he has so many interesting topics he can share with us. So when I asked Dan again, what kind of topic is uh, interesting to share with, and he like talked about the visible for, uh, <coughs> visible for, for light here now for uh, integrated photonics. So uh, light, I think I probably rather than uh, Speak more for that here now, but one more thing here now, uh, Dave Austin right now is also in the Santa Barbara. So Dan said uh, he sometimes is able to uh, meet uh, Professor Dave Austin on the beach when uh, Dave actually shooting some photos. Some people probably know Austin Switch, right? Dave Austin Switch, which come from Dave Austin uh, and which Dave's also my boss as well. He's such a small word and also it's a big word. So see so many people here and have their great career in the future. Let's uh, have uh, invite Dan to uh, take uh, the stage and share with us about his uh, recent uh, research. Thank you. Thank you, Shang and Wayne. Uh, it's good to be back. This is Manolo Mater. And um, I have immense respect for Wayne and Zisheng. So they deserve two quick stories. Um, <laughs> Let's see, Wayne. I have a lot of stories, Wayne. So I'm going to spare you. But let me just say about Wayne that um, being an undergrad researcher in Gerard Maru's group, uh, Wayne knows this all too well. You'd be sitting there in the office, Gerard would come in, he would tell you some new idea that he had in the middle of the night. Uh, it was something no one had ever done before in the world, but he would make it sound like it was no problem. And he would tell you the problem and he'd say, and he would say, piece of cake and turn around and walk out. Right, Wayne? Piece of cake? I, I might have said that. <laughs> no, no, uh, Gerard, Gerard a piece of cake, right? Oh, piece of cake, yeah, of course. Yeah, piece of cake, right? turn around and walked out. And you're just like, 
They said it's a piece of cake. I guess it should be easy, right? Um, so Wayne uh, helped me survive in the group, um, so to speak. Um, Wayne and some other close friends uh, as an undergrad, it could be very daunting, but they made it a very good experience. And we've been lifelong friends for 45 years now. I don't even know how time goes that fast. Um, Zisheng and I became very close at Columbia. Zisheng is wonderful. We, we did talk a lot about family or offices or maybe a story. A quick story about Zisheng, you may remember this, you may not. He came in one day and he's like, I don't understand. And I'm like, what? He says, well, I started an experiment yesterday with optical fiber, and I'm putting UV light in the optical fiber to make a lens at the end of it with this photoresist. But today, everything's different. The fiber's changed. Well, that's the only thing I can think about is I, and at that point, no one had written about, or I think discovered photorefractive writing in optical fibers. And Zisheng saw this effect in the fiber, not knowing what it was. And Zisheng being Zisheng, he was not going to let that alone. It was not going to be, oh, I'm just going to ignore this odd effect. So he went deep down that rabbit hole. And uh, that's a lesson that I'll never forget is when you see something that looks like an anomaly, uh, it's more worthwhile checking it out because it may prove to be something very, very important. So I thank both these guys for playing such a, a pivotal role in my career. And um, Gobin and Professor Agrawal and I were just talking. Uh, sometimes my career seems a little broad, uh, but there's actually a method to the madness underneath. Uh, there are common threads. Um, sometimes I'm the only one that sees it, um, but uh, students in the group do. Uh, so about 12 years ago, um, I had come back from doing two year leave of absence at the uh, company that I started, Pack Photonics. And my group had gone down to two students. Um, my grants had just dwindled out and I came back and I pretty much freaked out. I was like, oh man, this is bad. Um, but at the same time, I'm, a, I'm an optimist and I thought, well, this is an opportunity to think about what can I restart in the lab? Uh, what can I do that's fresh? And I'm being trained here at Rochester and, um, you know, I, I think this place is very much about applied physics, certainly the laboratory for laser energetics is. And, um, and so I thought, you know, the platform that we're working in for lasers that I'll tell you about, it, I know its band gap goes down to the visible. So I think it's time to re-energize the group to go into the visible and to start working with atoms and quantum. And this was before a lot of people were even thinking about doing this. So it's kind of crazy at the time. You know, the nice part I'll tell you about this is that it was wonderful for about three or four years to enjoy working on something that a lot of other people didn't work on. Because once people get in the field, it becomes crowded. It kind of loses the, uh, oh, I can just relax and do what I want to do when I want to do it. And we have exited that time. It is uh, popular now and important. And I'll talk about the progress that we've made um, in visible light photonics and the connection to atomic and quantum applications. Are we stuck in presenting? Thank you. Is that pointer something here? Switched. switched. Oh, it's switched. See, that's pretty good. Oh, I see it. Yeah. Uh, no, it's it's just got the side by side video on Zoom. It's a Zoom. Oh, right. Right. Yeah. It, it looks fine here from remote locations. Oh, okay. That's good. That's good. So um, today we have eight students in the group, um, eight PhD students and six undergraduate students. And the lesson that I learned at Rochester uh, was that being an undergrad, you could do everything because you didn't know what you couldn't do. So um, undergraduates play a pivotal role in the research. Um, today, we uh, are funded by seven companies in the lab in addition to government funding. And we work with these groups up here um, in different capacities. But what you can see are different applications, ions for quantum computing, that's quantinium in Boulder. There's entangled atoms for quantum sensing, that's Jun Yi's group at JOA. Uh, atomic clocks at NIST and JOA, and gravitational wave detection, LIGO. And I think that the common theme that you can see in all these pictures is it takes a lot of lasers and optics. And that's if you just want to talk to a couple of ions or atoms, 
or qubits and what happens if you want to scale up to hundreds, thousands, or millions or tens of millions. So it becomes uh, fairly intractable. And also, what if you want to make a sortable system, for example, that you want to deploy in space? So the vision that we work on is to make the photonics that can put these systems on a chip, including the lasers, the modulators, reference cavities, uh, beam emitters that can couple to uh, ions and atoms, as well as play with all the wavelengths that you need in the atom and the quantum world. And then the microphone is a pointer somewhere there. Oh, okay, sure. If you need it. Do we have it um, on Kali in the pointer there? All dead. If you can put this technology on chip, you can do things like quantum and precision fiber applications, new physics and discoveries, portable position navigation, timing atomic clocks, quantum computing, communications and sensing, test and measurement climate science and space-based and mobile applications. So there's a fairly rich application space for this technology. Now, today, if you go around the world, and this is just a subset, you'll find a lot of bits and pieces of this technology on chips. So if you had a photonic supermarket and you had your shopping cart and you went around the supermarket, you might pick up things like narrow alignment lasers, also lost photonics, Nonlinear photonics, control, visible light integration, beam delivery, modulator gates, reference cavity, isolator, single photon, and entangled sources, just to name a few. And here are just some examples of work done at UCSB and other collaborators in around the world in this area. But how do you not only make each of these work, but how do you get them all on the same chip? And that's not an easy problem. especially because the quantum world is not like you can go up to an atom and say, hello, Adam, I'm going to negotiate which wavelengths you want to talk with, right? You don't negotiate with an atom. They tell you what their resonant wavelengths are. So, that, and that's this atom. Now you go to another atom and it's different. Go to an ion and it's different. But now you want to do things with these atoms and ions. You want to uh, probably cool them and trap them. You want to interrogate them. This is all called state preparation. You want to uh, interrogate and probe them. You might want to do uh, repumping of the states. And these all require transitions. And so you have this uh, quantum palette of wavelengths. And you can just see an example of the telecom band down to 400 nanometers and different kinds of atoms and ions with their transition wavelengths, or at least some of them. So that's a problem in itself. It's not like the communications world where you can just go and claim I'm going to set a frequency grid of 100 gigahertz channels and I'm done. Now I know where to make my laser. You need to be able to make lasers at all these frequencies. They all have different properties. They all have different alignments and stability, phase noise, and power. It really is a smorgasbord of lasers, okay? And depending on what you want to do. And so when you want to integrate these onto a platform, what are your choices? Well, today, four types of low-loss material platforms that we work with, they have different band gaps. Silicon nitride is the one we work in mostly. Thank you. Silicon nitride is the one that we work with mostly, and it has a band gap that takes you from about 4 or 5 nanometers out to 2350. So if we want to put light through these waveguides, we can go down to about 400 nanometer wavelength light. If we want to go lower, we may go into tantalum pentoxide, otherwise known as tantalum. You can also use amorphous alumina oxide. This is uh, aluminum layer deposition grown alumina. And then there's aluminum nitride. They all have benefits. They all have pros and cons. Our platform is most mature with silicon nitride today. Part of the story. Here's the quantum world today and the atomic world going to 200 nanometers all the way out to 1600 nanometers. 
Now, I, I made up some of these names. They're names that I use. It's not like they're standard or anything, but I call this band down here extreme, short, mid, long, and extended because the extended wavelengths, people will use those and frequency double them using techniques like second harmonic generation, as is done here at Rochester, um, uh, to get you down into the visible. So there are many ways to get to the visible. And this is the map that I like to talk about. And underneath this map is a hugely rich semiconductor material system. All these materials from aluminum nitride to GAN, to gallium arsenide to indium phosphide based, these are the band gaps that you need to create wavelengths and amplifiers and, and semiconductor active devices that can operate in this wavelength band. So how are you going to put all this together? I mean, basically it's saying that you need semiconductor wafers that, for example, can operate in chunks across these different bands. Then you may choose this waveguide connection platform from any one of the technologies that you will choose from to put these gain blocks on, create wires and filters and modulators on those. And then you may want to do nonlinearity. So you may put in uh, chips that have lithium niobium. So how do you combine all this onto one platform it is the hard problem that people are trying to solve today. In this integration technology, invisible light photonics, this is the hard problem, okay? The bits and pieces everybody's working on, it's hard too, but putting it all together is really hard and it is where people want to go. So just a little bit about this waveguide platform. And I, I just want to zoom through some of these fairly quickly because I've talked about this last time I was here. So in silicon nitride, just one takeaway, is that we can create these circuits on a 200 millimeter CMOS platform. So they're 200 millimeter wafers and they are run through a CMOS foundry. They go in, no one touches them, they come out, and then we also do post-processing with them. Today, we can hit 0.034 dB per meter loss at 1560 nanometers and 720 million Q resonators. This is a completely different operating point than other technologies allow you to do. You can make devices and systems that you can't make with other technologies because of the loss in the Q. At the visible, we're able to hit 0.36 dB per meter at 780 nanometers and 140 million Q at 780 nanometers. And that's remarkable in the visible. And our visible losses hover around that. 780 is a wavelength for rubidium atom transitions. And I'll talk about rubidium a little later. Um, what I show here is just an example chip that has a bunch of lasers, tunable lasers at uh, some atom or ion transitions. Um, they may be stabilized. I'll talk about that later. Uh, they may have modulation sidebands on them. And eventually, they come out of a chip as beams of light to trap neutral atoms or to talk to ions, okay? So that's one of the vision figures that you can see in this technology. And one of the things that we do is we make narrow line with lasers at this technology. Just a really fast short circuit on narrow line with lasers. Why would you need them? Um, you might want to talk, for example, to a rubidium atom through a two photon transition. And there you're trying to hit an extremely narrow transition to make a very stable atomic clock. And the noise on the laser has to be really, really low. So that would be a very low line with laser that you would use with rubidium atoms. You could also make an atom interferometer or a gradiometer. And I'll talk about that at the end of the talk to actually measure gravity's effect on an atom and probe that with light. I mean, we are in a different world today. I mean, from when I went to school to now, the things that are being done now, it's, it's just amazing. It's fascinating. It's exciting. Um, back in 2000, I think people were saying research was dead. There was no new problems to work on. Everything that's been done has been done already. And now you look back 23 years and you realize, boy, that was totally off the mark. And today it's just remarkable. I mean, I, I find it hugely exciting. So I'll talk a little bit about these later on. Um, examples of narrow alignment lasers that we make on this platform are brilliant scattering. Um, your groups here working on brilliant at the Institute. Um, this is an example of a silicon nitride bus 
coupled to a ring resonator. When we inject light into this resonator, it actually forms phonons, generates phonons all along the waveguide, continuously generating phonons, and the pump light going in is scattering off those phonons continuously. And we are able to make these at 674, 689, 698, and 780 nanometers now. This platform is so reliable that we pretty much take material parameters, put them into a multi-physics simulation with Ryan at NAU. We have a common colleague. We call him the amazing uh, theory person, right? He's amazing. And anyway, he is able to exactly simulate the brilliant gain in the waveguide material at that wavelength to tell us where to look for it. Because as colleagues here know, it's very hard to find these gain. Um, and then we make a laser out of it. Um, so here's an example of a brilliant laser. Uh, this is a frequency noise plot. I don't know if you're used to looking at these plots, but this is offset from the carrier. Uh, there's 100 kilohertz, 10 kilohertz, 100 kilohertz, a megahertz. And that's the noise as you um, go off frequency, the green line is the pump, and what we achieve the uh, blue line as we drive this brilliant laser up. You can also see the laser go in the threshold. Beautiful thing about brilliant is it narrows the line with the laser, collapses the line due to the time constants of the phonons relative to the lifetime of the optical phonon of the photons themselves. And you can reduce the line width, the fundamental line width by a thousand to a million using these devices. Okay. Um, but that's only part of the story. Um, here's an example recently of a 780 nanometer device. Uh, we actually get four orders of Stokes shifts. So this is uh, uh, photons creating gratings, creating photons, creating gratings, creating photons four times. Um, this particular 780 nanometer laser has an optical threshold of 900 uh, microwatts. So we see brilliant at 900 microwatts. And the reason we can see that and that it works so well is because the Q of this cavity is 140 million. So there you go, there's Q and loss, giving you something. What is the something? These are the only functioning visible light brilliant lasers on chip in the world. So no one has replicated brilliant on a chip in the visible in a waveguide structure, to my knowledge. The reason we can do it is because of the low loss of the silicon nitride waveguides. So, so Dan, what is the Q of the acoustic cavity? There's there, an idea. There is no, and this is the beauty of this platform. So there is no acoustic cavity. As a matter of fact, silicon nitride does not form a waveguide. All right. When people do brilliant lasers, they spend a lot of time trying to phase match the optical and acoustic modes. Suspended silicon waveguides, other approaches. For us, we create no acoustic waveguide whatsoever. The loss is so low that the photons are continually generating bulk phonons. So it's, it's kind of like being a skier behind a boat that's continually generating the wave. So the photons are so long lived, they're so low loss, but they're always generating bulk phonons, mm -hmm. which have very wide gain bandwidth, about 250 megahertz, which is the sweet spot for making the laser, because you just tune your resonance to lay somewhere over that. And, um, and then it'll follow any structure that you make, could it be serpentines or whatever, but that's, this is being done around this ring over and over and over again. So all that's required is the free spectral range needs to fit uh, somewhere in that 250 megahertz gain bandwidth that's offset. In this case, for visible light, the offset frequency from the pump is about 26 gigahertz. So that's about the brilliant shift between the pump and the um, phonon mode is about 26 gigahertz. Question. That, that's why these work. And that's why we can make them work. Today, I would say pretty much anybody wants to. Um, we're getting more sophisticated. Um, this is not openly published yet. Um, this is an example of the brilliant laser with a tunable Stokes filter that now routes the pump out one port and the Stokes filter out the other port. And so any residual pump that comes back, we're able to now reduce it by a factor of 30 dB. Okay, that's all on one chip. I'll keep talking about the sophistication that we go to. What you're seeing here that's not being used right now, by the way, is a coil reference cavity on that same chip. 
and I'll talk about the coil reference cavities in a little bit. But you can see that our laser performs extremely well. Here's the frequency noise here. And uh, by the way, this green dashed line here is thermal refractive performance of this ring right here uh, down to about 10 kilohertz. Um, the data below that is not valid. Uh, thermal refractive noise is the actual glass and silicon nitride molecules that are vibrating due to quantum thermal fluctuations. So the way you get that noise down is you make the mode volume of the cavity bigger, it averages temperature out over larger areas, and it quiets down this noise. So the only way to get around TRN is by making the mode volume bigger. That's an important takeaway. So this is close to one of our state-of-the-art chips for um, this um, kind of system. Um, the 140 million Q lets us take a really cheap fiber coupled 780 nanometer fabric row laser, the cheapest that you can find, and we connect it to that same resonator that made Brillion, and we turn it into an injection lock laser. We actually self injection lock the fiber pro laser to the 140 million Q cavity, and we get 600 millihertz fundamental line width. I do not think anybody in the world has ever demonstrated a subhertz fundamental line width 780 nanometer laser. The integral line width of this laser, given that we're measurement limited at this point, is under 700 hertz. Let me say that again. That's a visible light laser made out of just a silicon nitride cavity and a fabric perot that's giving you sub kilohertz performance with subhertz fundamental line width. That's the class of laser that you use to drive some of the world's best atomic clocks. Okay. So while this technology is not all together right now, it's starting to look pretty good. Here's an example of another laser that we make. This is an external cavity tunable laser. It uses a gain chip semiconductor, one of the ones we talked about at the beginning. And then there's tunable rings and a nonlinear and a linear Sagnac mirror here, blood band mirror. You can see the silicon knife right here. And I'll talk about this in just a minute. All of these rings that you see are tunable today using temperature tuners and piezoelectric technology that's been deposited on top of these waveguns. And I'll get to that in just a minute. So you have a choice of lasers. You have just the gain check itself. You have FP. You can lock an FP to uh, do self-injection locking. You can make a brilliant laser. You can make an external cavity laser in this technology. That can be your laser building block, choosing which one you want to work with. But what can you do with that that's more? There's something called a stabilized laser. Today, we don't talk narrow line widths anymore. Today, we talk stabilized lasers. And when you go into an AMO lab, or an atomic clock lab or a quantum lab, what you will see on the table are stabilized lasers. These are lasers that have been connected optically to a very stable reference cavity using a pound driven hole lock or a PID lock to then take, make the laser take on the qualities of the cavity. And so the better you can make the cavity, the better you can make the laser operate. You need about a megahertz, 10 megahertz of gain bandwidth, and you need high gain, but you still can make the laser take on the qualities of the cavity. The laser is a hot cavity, it's nonlinear. This other cavity is cold. And as a matter of fact, you're trying to dump into it as little photons as possible because you don't want any temperature dependent noise to be injected in from photon noise. So you try to run this cavity very cold. That's called a stabilized laser on a chip. What we have is our laser here, for example, this tunable laser. And then we have a reference cavity that we make on chip. Today, we make three meter, four meter, and 10 meter cavities on chip. And that's remarkable. It's hard to make a four meter cavity out on a tabletop. We have a modulator that I'll we'll talk about that generates side bands on this laser, and we lock one of those side bands to the quadrature of the resonator. So the coil resonator has a dip like this, like an atom dip, and we lock to the quadrature point on there. And so now this laser takes on the properties of that cavity. 
Then the laser itself, the native laser, we actually feed back to the laser and we lock it. And then at the output, we might modulate sidebands on it to do the next step of business. We may tether to an atom transition. We may lock to the sideband uh, red detune because we don't want to heat the atom transition up. We might um, use this for a communication system. But this is a stabilized laser on chip. This is what the group is working very hard right now to do is all of this on a single chip. So you have one chip that operates at the wavelength you want to work at that gives you stable light that replaces a tabletop setup. Today, this is what stable laser looks like at LIGO. There's something that you might find, for example, in a precision lab. Um, actually, this is something you might see at Colorado, Jilla. Here, actually, is something we have in our lab. Uh, they'll put these in racks, they'll build the lasers in a box. Um, today, people also make these cavities, micro cavities, and whispering galleries. And we're down here at the Waveguide Integration Point. And they're not all the same performance, but the point is to be able to make uh, portable sources and low cost sources. This is an example of a four meter cavity on a chip. So that literally is 12 feet of waveguide with 160 million Q. Fabricated on a 200 millimeter platform. Take a laser, we lock it to that cavity. Here's the free running laser frequency noise right here. When we lock that laser to this cavity, we hug the thermal refractive limit right there. This chip cavity, it's about this big, made a true 36 hertz laser. Today, with this experiment, which is already a couple of years old, the carrier frequency stability was 1.8 E minus 13 at 10 milliseconds, which is really remarkable. This is getting close to being an atom grade class laser stable cavity. 36 hertz is stable enough that people are now using these in fiber networks to use the fiber network as a huge sensor network. 36 hertz is about the line width for round trip time in the submarine system to listen to all the effects that are happening under the ocean. Modulators are not, yes. How are you measuring 36 line? This is a very good question. Um, so let me give you that real quick. So um, there's two, way we, two ways that we measure phase noise. One is we have something called the optical fiber discriminator. It's basically an asymmetric mock zender. One arm, we have packs that we plug in and out um, to change the discrimination slope. And then we measure phase to frequency intensity noise. And then we do um, Fourier, fast Fourier transforms. That's good for about 10 kilohertz out. And it is very accurate, by the way. But for 10 kilohertz and closer in, the, the fiber itself just has too much environmental business going on and there's drift also. And for reasons that I want to, it doesn't not worth going into right now, you can't lock that uh, interferometer. Um, we now make that interferometer chip right now. I didn't put it on the slides. Um, and that gets us probably down to about kilohertz, um, having all of that on a chip, that measurement tool. Um, but for one kilohertz in, we have in the laboratory a one hertz laser. It's a stable laser system cavity about this big um, that's vacuum um, and, and acoustic driven. We stabilize that laser, a laser. We have a reference laser to stabilize that cavity. Um, but then the question is, well, Dan, how do you know what the close to carrier noise behavior is for that cavity to measure 36 hertz? So we have a dual frequency comb in the lab that's self-referenced that's then microwave tethered to a rubidium atomic clock to GPS that gives us one E minus 14 long-term stability. So we do have a true one hertz laser, one E minus 14 in the lab that we then do heterodyne beat note detection with the signal and then we use an electronic frequency discriminator with a frequency counter to then measure all that noise in close to carrier. And that's the long shot of it. And then on top of that, those numbers match up with the ADO. So, so those are two cross checks that we do. 
as the best one. The performance is really impressive because we are trying to find a model system. Mm -hmm. so, so I know it's really very impressive. So I'm just curious, so, so why this such a such an on-chip cavity could, could, could get rid of the a thermal drift or a string drift on the chip? So the question is, why is the cavity so good? Um, we were actually surprised. We knew the cavity was going to be good because of lower load volume. Uh, it's not going to be as good as a vacuum cavity because it has all this material in there. So our gain has to be in cavity volume. Right? That's why we moved to four meters and 10 meters. Um, the drift of the cavity is an issue, the long-term drift. Um, we today have a second cavity that we put in the feedback loop that we've engineered. We've, we've grown tantalum waveguides on top of quartz. They have opposite thermal expansion coefficients. And so we engineer the waveguides so that the zero crossing is at the wavelength that we're working at. And so right now there's one chip used for say 10 Hertz out ish. And then this chip here is used for white one Hertz, you know, ish. Um, so right now today, in terms of these waveguides for long term stability, we employ several different techniques, but just the coil by itself. I mean, to be honest with you, I honestly think that we'll get it down close to 2 to the minus 14 at some point, just the coil. But probably at 100 milliseconds. And so the question is, what applications is that good for, right? If you have an atomic clock, your state preparation, and everything is on the order of 100 millisecond cycle time, then you're, you know, you could be good to go, right? Or some kind of a shaken lattice interferometer, which I'll talk about. Um, so it all depends on the application then is what is the observation there will have to be the uh, figure out. And you know, I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah. So um, modulation is key. Today, people uh, put electro optic modulators out in these AMO experiments, or they may have an acoustic optic modulator to tune the phase frequency of the light. As a matter of fact, when we tell you the laser to the reference cavity, it's actually the AOM output the frequency shifted version that they're tethering because that's the part that you can move. And I'll tell you about our design that we have that just ditches the AOM altogether, which is great. But this is a piezoelectric transducer. This is you can barely see it here. There's a bus waveguide silicon nitride up on the top here. And then I don't know if the folks on Zoom maybe you should stand over here. There's a bus waveguide on the top right there. And then there's a resonator underneath the structure here. What's what, what we're seeing is here's silicon nitride, here's the core waveguide. There is silicon dioxide on the lower and the upper clad. And then the PZT is actually planar deposited after all of our nitride process is done. The stress field is induced laterally across the nitride waveguide that way. We keep the PZT away from the optical mode. So this does not impact the loss of the waveguides at all. On top of that, depending on what wavelength we want to work at, we just, the PZT works with the waveguide structure. The power dissipation is only 90 nanowatts. So all of a sudden you have a technology that today that has about 25 megahertz of bandwidth. It's independent of wavelength. It doesn't affect the waveguide loss of the Q and it's only 90 nanowatts dissipation and you have a desirable modulator for an integration platform. So that's the key is electric transition technology uh, that we make today. Here's an example of how you could apply that to get rid of the AOM. So on a chip, we have a laser. That laser's frequency can be controlled, for example, by a PID loop or something else. You can, maybe it's an external cavity laser, any kind of laser that you can tune. We have our modulator there, silicon nitride. And what we do is we interface it with a bias T, which has an RF and a DC port. And we tap off the energy coming at the output. And we put that through the DC port, control port. And what happens is, as the laser is being aligned to the reference cavity, in terms of frequency, carrier, and noise, so, you know, remember, it's not just the center of the laser that's being aligned, it's all its noise components too. As those are being aligned, the modulator actually follows it. 
So the modulator follows the laser no matter what we do to it. And what we're doing to it is we're taking the laser and we're locking it to a reference cavity and driving that back to the laser. So the modulator will always create the double side bands to lock quadrature lock to the reference cavity, which drives back and lowers the noise of the laser itself. There's no AOM in here. There's only two PCT modulator, actually really just one PCT modulator in this work. And we lower the noise by four orders of magnitude. And the ADEV here. So you're starting to see bits and pieces of stabilized lasers come out on a common integration platform. What other kinds of tools do you need for atoms? You need spectroscopy. You need to be able to sit there with a laser and probe all of the atom transitions, find the one that you want to work at and lock to it. Okay. Here's an example of taking our tunable resonator cavity. We take a 780 nanometer DVR laser and a PDH lock to the cavity, but now the cavity has a thermal tuner on it and PCT, and we actually tune the cavity as we want to in real time. In this case, we split the cavity across a 250 megahertz range and a 500 hertz uh, ramp. And there you see the actual spectroscopy of the rubidium atom, just with a simple laser and one of these tunable cavities. Then we choose which transition we want to be on and we lock to it. Also see the PCT doing its work, and you see the cue doesn't change at all when you tune the PCT device itself. The resonator. Um, just really quickly, um, I just want to say that we've done work um, with NIST and MIT. This is a single photon emitter um, that's made in gallium arsenide. It's on a membrane transfer platform. The dot, a dot is sitting inside there, a 980 nanometer dot is sitting inside this waveguide that's designed here, and we designed the mechanical features inside the nitride platform so that these emitters could be picked up and placed inside these cavities and they're mechanically registered to the waveguide and we are able to transfer single photons into one dB per meter loss waveguides. I think you can imagine now how this technique could now be used with the other gain blocks that I was showing before. So let me just give you some ideas of the atom work going on in the laboratory. What I'd like to do is just introduce some work. For example, here's uh, one of June's experiments at, at Jilla. Um, they make a laser that's so stable that they can create um, arrays of trapped ions that are moving through a lattice in real time, literally like an elevator of these arrays. And they can come in with a laser that's so stable to probe atoms that are only order millimeters apart from each other and see the effect of gravity on time dilation across several millimeters. In other words, they see time shift and the, and the laser is that good to see the time shift across these trapped atoms. I mean, that to me, it just blows my mind. Okay, that kind of system takes up large laboratories. Today, people are moving those on check with what's called trapped ion structures. They have RF fields that contain the ions, and then you probe the ions with the lasers, and that is starting to go to the chip scale. This is work out of uh, Robert Niffenegger's group. He's at UMass Amherst now, um, and this shows beams coming out of the trip, chip that are used to cool down the ion and then talk to the, uh, actually, and this is not talk to the transition, but here to, to cool the ion even further. So that's an ion system. Um, this is, I showed you this picture before. This is what that system will eventually look like on chip. Today, we in my lab are working with neutral atoms. So we work with rubidium. Uh, there's all kinds of reasons why you work with neutrals versus ions. Um, you can make atomic clocks, quantum computers, and gravity mapping with neutrals. Um, you don't use an RF trap to, uh, to cool the uh, neutrals. You need to make what's called a three-dimensional magneto-optic trap. And so here's an example of what we're putting on the chip to do cold atom integrated photonics. So you can see several lasers here. 
You can see a stabilization cavity and some modulators. You can see waveguides going to something that I'll show you called grading emitters. They create beams coming out, and then there's a vapor cell that contains the rubidium atoms. There's magnetic coils, and we use this structure to actually cool down and trap rubidium atoms in, in a lot. And then you can do something next with those, like an atomic clock, a quantum gravitational sensor, and other things once you have the mod. So where we are at today is, um, here's the example of the mod. You have six beams. You can do three in retro-reflective phase six beams. That creates your um, equal pressure on the atoms to bring them to a, a, a localized position. Um, and the next stage cooling down is when you turn on these magnetic coils and Helmholtz field creates a null at the same place as the beam intersections. And then, and then you suck the atoms into that energy minimum. That's for first stage cooling. It's about 200 microkelvin. And, um, and there's the next stage that we're working on right now, uh, which is called sub Doppler cooling. So this is our system today. Um, we have our lasers. We have this pit that actually delivers beams. These are four millimeter gratings. They deliver four millimeter collimated beams coming out of the chip. And for those of you who have dealt with collimating beams, that's pretty amazing to make a subwave like 780 nanometer grating that can deliver four millimeter collimated beams. They remain collimated over just some of that long. Now, the grating is butt up against the vapor cell, literally, and the intersection point is about nine millimeters above the surface. Um, you can see uh, just a top down view of the eliminated grating structure. And then here, you actually can see the outcome of the experiment. Um, what we show here is the chip on the bottom of this left-hand figure here. And you can see the beams emitting from the chip. You can see the square vapor cell. There's an ion pump back here that's uh, pushing the uh, rubidium in. It's the sources back there and creating the vacuum. Um, you can see the beams aggregating the phases here. And right there in the middle, you see 1.3 million rubidium atoms cooled down to 200 microkelvin. And this is, as far as I know, the only photonic integrated beam delivery of a 3D mod that's been done to date. Um, you can see we've had to learn everything that we need so far to know. There's much more to know, but we actually measure uh, atomic cloud temperatures. We have something called time of flight measurements. You can see uh, the capture points of a video as, as we turn off the timing of the beams, and you can see the cloud starting to expand. And we use um, also something called carrier capture recapture um, techniques. Um, we use absorption spectroscopy and fluorescence spectroscopy. So all these tools have to be brought online in order to measure the uh, number of atoms in the cloud and uh, estimate the error bars in the atoms too, and also then to calculate the temperature, which we get at just about 200 microkelvin. So we have a really good infrastructure in the lab today for neutral atoms inside a 3D model. And um, hopefully there's a, we'll have something that's coming out soon that you can see where it compares uh, our performance to that of other uh, grading type structures that people have made in free space. Um, and you can do all kinds of things with this. This is a program we have, we have a project in collaboration with NIST. This is the paper they published. This is that whole vapor cell shrunk down to about a millimeter on each side. And so we're working today to attach that vapor cell directly to the chip to make an actual rubidium spectroscopy lock module on the chip. So just by itself, one vapor without any cold, it will have the stability of a rubidium atom, 1E minus 14-ish, with about a 5 megahertz alignment, um, all on the chip. And that's something that doesn't exist today. Um, we also work with Paul Kuhn's at ARL. Once you can make these MOTs, you can take another laser and come in and excite the rubidium atoms to the Rydberg state. This is a barely ionizing state. It, it's so sensitive that it makes a really nice electromagnetic detector. So any EM frequencies uh, that are resonant with that state, you can detect with very low levels. So you can make an electrical uh, spectrometer uh, with these Rydberg atoms. Down to about 20 gigahertz. And then eventually, uh, we worked with uh, Mark Safman at uh, U Wisconsin and, and Jen Choi. Uh, you can take uh, something that looks like this in Mark's lab and you put it down onto a chip like this for cold atoms with optical tweezers to actually start manipulating 
uh, once you've made the 3D mod, the actual atoms themselves at the atomic level. And this is where we're going uh, with this technology. Um, we just got awarded an institute with NASA. Uh, this was jointly UT Austin is the lead, and it's with U Colorado and Caltech. Um, it's called Quantum Pathways. And the shaken lattice interferometer is something that was developed in Dana Anderson's group. And we are going to be taking the tabletop version that they're making and shrink it down to the chip scale so that it can be deployed in a satellite and used to measure microgravity changes in orbit for climate science and climate change, Earth, sea level rises, uh, ice changes, and other events with sensitivity from space. You're actually measuring the local gravity changes due to events that are happening on the Earth. Today, they do it with GRACE, if you want to look it up, GRACE, and it has a certain sensitivity and it takes a amount of time to process the data. These should be real-time instruments. And if you ever want to read about shaken lattice interferometry, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, the optical fields that trap the atoms, uh, they actually run machine learning language on it uh, that simulates uh, splitters, delay lines, and combiners to make an atom interferometer. Um, and using that kind of shaken lattice, which means that the trap, that in times the, the trap is changing, right? So that would be the lattice that is shaken. It makes a very sensitive instrument. And we're really excited to bring our technology to bear on that. And I would just like to say uh, that um, we are open. We have an open position for a postdoc in the group uh, for uh, devices and picks. Um, I have an announcement if anybody's interested, and I'd like to say thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. It was very nice to hear all the work going on in your lab over there. A lot of work. Yeah, all right. So I think they're open for questions. Um, anyone? I see a question from Jim. Did I hear? And you touched on the challenges of the metrology because, of course, to make these things, you got to measure these things. Yeah. Um, how do you measure your loss when it gets that low? That's a very good question. So um, one thing I didn't tell you was how we get all that um, the uh, reference system down to the visible. I thought that was going to be the question. But um, measuring the loss, um, we have several techniques that we use. We used to use old backscatter with cytometry. Not sensitive enough anymore. Um, so everything is measured with either very long spirals, where we do measure backscatter, um, but really uh, we measure the Q of the resonator and we uh, calculate, we backtrack out the um, the loss from the intrinsic Q. But we, we also, in all of our measurements, we do something called ring down. So we hit the resonator um, with light, we charge it all the way up, and we turn it off, and then we measure on the one over E point on ring down, and we correlate that one over E point with the uh, calculation from the uh, Lorentzian measurement for the resonator itself. So it's two independent measurements. And it's a good question, though, because that's no loss. So can I just do a follow up on yeah. that, Dan? So when you're, when you're characterizing things with a resonator, mm -hmm. how do you decouple? the intrinsic loss from the cavity, intrinsic cavity lifetime because of the coupling. So we, we make we, we make a split of devices with different coupling coefficients. So we get a map of loaded resonances. Okay. And what we're measuring is the loaded resonance, but using the ring down and uh, RF calibrated mock center interferometer, um, we're able to tease out the intrinsic resonance from that. Yeah. We are going to tease out the coupling loss ratio itself. Because we can have undercoupled critically and overcoupled. We usually go over and map. Yeah. A question from uh, Wayne. Wayne, you want to go ahead? Yeah, sure. Uh, two quick ones. So one, um, you, it looks like you are still using external uh, you know, laser diodes to run the thing. And I'm just wondering, um, I mean, you may eventually want to integrate them on chip, but maybe it's not that important. Uh, is that is that true that it's 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 not really important or it's it one out one of your goals? No, it's important, and we are working on it right now. So we have three different approaches that we take. One of them is 
we, we create those pockets that you saw for the quantum source and the uh, gain blocks, which are uh, um, anti-reflection coded on the front face, on high reflection coded on the back face, they're called RSLAs. And then we pocket place gain blocks inside the pockets um, themselves. Um, we also have an inverse taper coupled structure where the inverse taper is actually grown on the semiconductor gain medium. And then it couples to a tapered structure in the nitride, much like the, um, the uh, quantum structure that you saw. Um, and those, those are predominantly the two main ones. Um, and we're looking at something called print transfer to actually take the gain blocks from the epi stacks and move them onto the chips uh, using the GDS files that were used to actually make the masks for the chips themselves. So sounds the answer like is yeah, sounds like you're going to do it. Another quick question is. I wonder what Steve Chu thinks about all this stuff that you're doing here with the 3D, you know, little tiny uh, traps, you know, because I'm thinking back to his lab at Bell Labs, you know, the, the way he first did the optical molasses. Did you ever calculate um, how much smaller your volume is than Steve Chu's whole lab? Um, uh, yeah. did, you calculate, did you calculate uh, how much less uh, electrical power you're using than Steve Chu's lab? Because it just must be humongous uh, ratio, right? Well, it's, it's quite remarkable. I actually interviewed with Steve Chu back in the mid 80s. Um, and I had heard rumors was the F by tennis to be in the group, which turned out to be true. Um, <laughs> and, um, uh, but he had only just shown, as a matter of fact, during the interview, he brought me in and showed the tabletop where he had just done the Bose Einstein composition. And unfortunately, I didn't accept the offer because he wanted me to build the vacuum system in this in this um, uh, concrete closet. Looking back on it, maybe it was a bad decision. Um, <laughs> it wasn't really into vacuum systems at the time, but you know, clearly he went on to do amazing work, but the system was huge. It was a lot of power, the lasers, you know, the cooling of the cryostats. Um, I mean, people get those Einstein condenses today because they understand how to make them. You know, back then, Steve was only figuring that out, right? And yeah. so the optimization of that process and looking at different atoms um, that are more energy efficient and, and, and more productive in terms of Bose-Einstein condensates, um, that in itself is just miniaturized and reduced the amount of power needed. It's just because he laid the groundwork and now people are optimizing it, right? So yeah. I, I think that, you know, we're going to be looking at Bose-Einstein condensate mm -hmm. users that are, you know, more of a leader cubed um, which is many orders of magnitude less than what he had in, in volume and power. So I think, you know, over 40 years, I'd say that we've seen uh, probably um, three orders of magnitude reduction in, in volume and power uh, to do this, this science. And I think it's really important. Yeah, mind blown. Thank you. It's mind blown. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It is amazing. Any other questions for people in June? Uh, yes, uh, Si Chen here now. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for this uh, very impressive talk. Uh, I have a question here. Maybe you already answered and or maybe presented well. So you are ultra low loss in the silicon nitride. What's the trick get a such a ultra low? Is that because of material quality, or is because of better design for waveguide? Why is there such a high Q factor? It's a great question, Zisheng, and we get asked this question from a lot of people. Um, I'll try to give you the high levels first. Um, to get the lowest loss, we do a dilute mode, which means the mode is engineered to contain very little of the nitride in the mode overlap. It's still a waveguide. It's just more like a fiber waveguide. Um, the dominant contribution of losses in that zone are the sidewall scattering from the nitride and the absorption losses in the uh, oxide itself. So we, for our lowest losses, we make the mode not terribly big, but big enough. Um, we then know how to drill down the losses in the lower oxide and the upper oxide. But then to get to the next, to the lowest losses that we're at now, we had to ask the question, there was other absorption that was happening. And I long suspected, I thought, that it was due to uncompensated bonds on the nitride itself. Um, I didn't know that, um, but it seemed like the next place to look. And um, we were trying to make measurements, but the problem was is that any kind of, uh, for example, CV measurements that you'd make for 
uh, a surface effects in, in an electronic system requires transport properties, you know, and this is not, this is a semiconductor, you know, with large band gaps and so electrons aren't moving. So none of those techniques were available to us from our colleagues in the electron world. Um, we probably should have gone to Yuzi Shang and done probes and terahertz radiation. Um, but we, what happened was, and it was quite accidental, all of it, um, and fortuitous, is I was just searching around for um, uncompensated bonds in silicon nitride. And all of a sudden that happened on this paper. It's like, really? And it was an electronic memory paper. I didn't realize that they made electronic random access memory using silicon nitride, using uncompensated bonds to write the information. So they wanted them to be there and they used SIMS to look at the composition. And I was like, it's right there, there it is. And it brought it to the group. And we looked into that, we made the measurements and we saw the uncompensated bonds and we came up with ways to uh, passivate. Oh, we also play another trick. It's in our paper on the nature of communications where we actually, so the bottom line is that the last thing you want to do to the nitride when you start putting oxide on top is you don't want to etch it. Okay. And if you do etch it, you want to do passivation. I see. I see. But the point is, is if you leave an etched surface and start growing the upper oxide, you are going to have problems. It's going to start attracting uh, hydrogen and oxygen and other, uh, even if you're trying to anneal and bake it out, um, it's going to start making bonds that have all these resonances at it. So those are really the three things that we do uh, today. Uh, the last one, Zishan, is, is particles. So taking everything that I just told you and then make it in a CMOS environment where there are no human beings gets rid of the particles and that, that's the last piece to get out, out, of, out of the picture. So, so what is the Rayleigh scattering limit of silicon nitride, say at 780? So, okay, so you know, Tom, of course, asked the, the important next question, right? <laughs> is that we do know what the Rayleigh scattering limit is, and that's what we're working to next. And uh, we have some plots, of it, but I'd rather make sure they're correct before we share them. Um, but we're trying to now get down to the Rayleigh scattering. We actually even have ideas how to see the, the Rayleigh scattering limit. In the loss. So the, the work's not done yet. So, how many orders of magnitude are you about at this point? I'm not going to bet you anything. I'll explain that. You know what I'm talking about. You have a question here? Yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering. Oh, okay. I was going <laughs> to. Uh, I think we have another order or two to go. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I'm wondering if you get any extra thermal noise from having your PDH electronics on the chip near the reference. Oh, this is a great question. We, everybody had told us we were going to use PZTs. We were really going to take apart um, some PZT things from the lab, you know, old stages and stuff. And we we're going to glue them on top of our nitride circuits just to do the measurements. And um, PZT is noise. So if you're expecting that we see no noise from the PCT at all, not yet, at all. At least down to the noise that we're measuring right now. And we're measuring down like 0.02 hertz per hertz, so it's pretty low. I, I would probably would see it. It's there. All right, any other questions? I, I don't see anyone here. Anyone on the Zoom? So let me ask you a general question. You could get very little line width for visualization. What is the shortest line that you've achieved in the if it is if it's your integrated system you have here? Yeah, well, today I can let you say about the Burma injection locking agent. Yeah, you want to the shortest line? Well, that gives us the shortest fundamental line. Okay. Oh, no, it's not sure. So the shortest fundamental line we can get today is we make a dual ring resonator, a ring with inner ring. Mm -hmm. And and brilliant excites the, the moving gradients through the two photon okay. process. Um, and then you can get the next order gradient. So shallow towns tells us, you know, a couple of things. It tells us that we want a lot of photons inside the cavity. And if we're starting to generate an S2 tone, that means we clamp the number of photons in S1, so it's line will become bounded. 
Um, the other thing that we learned again with our colleague Brian, the, the amazing Brian Bukunu at NAU, um, through very detailed state simulations, um, is that when you create the S2 tone, it actually feeds a quantum phase noise back into S1. So to get the lowest line width, what you have to do is you have to inhibit uh, S2 delays. And the way we do that is we take a ring, we put a ring inside it, and we engineer the S2 resonance to be split so there's no mode to go into. All right. And so the lowest line of laser that we have today, we call it a photonic molecule, yes, the uh, is, is 88 millihertz. Wow. Okay. <laughs> And uh, the what is called is you call Henry the alpha factor plays over here in your thing? It does. Exactly. So Gilman knows all this is has to be the case. <laughs> so for a long time we didn't think there was a Henry factor in William. Carrie Valhalla is one of the amazing brilliant people. This group did great work. Carrie figured out the alphas. The line is an enhancement factor from the pump being detuned from resonance. Um, so there is an alpha line with enhancement factor and also quantum noise. Of the uh, phonons is actually greater than the optical noise, uh, quantum noise. Um, so there is a lot of the factor. The question is how much is it? And, um, and it's not large enough that you can't get down to the line. Yeah, 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 it's clear. But it is there. Yeah, yeah. Yes. It can be absolutely wrong number. You are doing very well. Yes, right. All right. So there are no questions, then I will call uh, time of here. Hi. Hi. Uh... Uh, yeah. <laughs>